today, um, we have invited Dr. Frank from NASA to talk about um, the challenges of space travel and a lot of things related to space. Uh, so we're very excited to have him here. So uh, let me talk a little bit about Create and Learn. So I'm Jesse. I'm the founder and CEO of Create and Learn. We started about three years ago, and uh, we focus on teaching students state-of-art computer science technologies. So with that, I'm going to hand this to Dr. Frank and really looking forward to your excellent talk. So go ahead, Dr. Frank. All right. So thank you very much, everybody, for, for coming today. So uh, the title of today's talk is Artificial Intelligence Powering Human Spaceflight Exploration of the Moon and Mars. Okay, so <clears throat> a very brief overview of what we're going to talk about today. So uh, I'm going to talk first about NASA's plans to go explore the moon and Mars. Uh, what, what we'll then talk about is something that, that Jesse alluded to with her questions, which is uh, there are some problems that we have to solve in order to go to the moon and Mars, and those problems primarily orient around how long it takes to communicate with our spacecraft. And uh, so we'll talk some about how artificial intelligence technology can help mitigate the problem of how long it takes to talk to our spacecraft. Uh, there are a couple of different AI technologies I'll talk about. I can give an example of how some of those things actually work. And uh, then I'll talk about some specific things that NASA is doing to demonstrate how this artificial intelligence technology really can make a difference uh, when, we, when we actually send our, our humans to Mars uh, and in the not too distant future. So let's talk about where our destinations are. So these are some pictures of the Apollo spacecraft. Uh, the last time human beings went to the moon. Anybody know when the last time a human being set foot on the moon? Anybody have any idea? Was it yesterday? Was it last year? Was it two years ago? What did people say? You had a lot of answers, right? A lot of different answers. Well, the unfortunate fact is that the last time anybody set foot on the moon was 1972. It was a long, long, long time ago. So these are some pictures from Apollo missions to the moon in the 1960s and 1970s. And um, the moon is not that far away from the Earth, relatively speaking, but it is quite far away. It's 238,000 miles. And that is far enough away that light actually takes a little while to get from the Earth to the moon. It takes 1.2 seconds for a beam of light that starts at the Earth to make it to the moon. 1.2 seconds. So when you think about it, that's actually kind of a long time. That's not the furthest place that we've considered sending people. So uh, what I've got in the next couple of slides is some pictures of asteroids. Um, asteroids are objects that, that float in space. Sometimes they come close to the Earth. Sometimes they fly very far away. Um, this is an asteroid that is called 1998 QE2. Sometimes we give asteroids very bizarre names uh, based on the year that they're discovered and, and what it is that, that we think is in them. So when this asteroid comes close to the Earth, it's 3.6 million miles away. That is so far away that light takes 14 seconds to get from the Earth to this asteroid when it's close to the moon. Uh, this is another asteroid. Uh, that has also sometimes come close to the Earth. And this is an asteroid that we actually sent to spacecraft to to go explore. It's called Itakawa. This is a picture that a Japanese spacecraft took in 2007. It's got some very, very interesting features. You can see there's this sort of, this sort of uh, <clears throat> bald patch, and then there are these some weird rocky patches. Um, this asteroid is 26 million miles away. Light takes 2.3 minutes to get from the Earth to this asteroid. That's almost as far as it takes, uh, as long as it takes light to get to Mars like we just talked about. So uh, the next thing that I have is a couple of great pictures of Mars. We've sent a lot of different spacecraft to Mars. Uh, this is a picture that was taken by, um, <clears throat> I believe this picture was taken by Spirit, which was one of the previous uh, rovers that we sent to Mars. So we heard this uh, at the very, very beginning, when Mars is as close to the Earth as it can be, when Mars is as close to the Earth as it can be, it is 34.8 million miles away. Light takes two and a half minutes to get from the Earth to Mars. But Mars isn't always as close to the Earth as that. Sometimes Mars is on the opposite side of the sun from the Earth. When Mars is on the other side of the sun from the Earth, it's 10 times as far away. It is 250 million miles. Light takes 24 minutes to get from the Earth to Mars when it's that far away. That is a crazy long time. How is it that we can operate spacecraft when we can't talk to them without them listening to us for 24 minutes? How is that possible? <clears throat> a 
Anybody have any ideas? Anybody in the chat want to think about whether we can do that or not? Obviously we can because we sent all these spacecraft to Mars and we actually got all these fabulous pictures back. So we must be able to do it somehow, right? Well, we can do it, but it's, it's very complex. Um, and, and we'll talk some more about that in the not too distant future here. But the, the thing that I want to do now is I want to talk a little bit about NASA's plans for sending people back to the moon. <clears throat> uh, this plan is called Project Artemis. Uh, if you've been watching the space news, anybody watch the space news, uh, you will have seen something about Project Artemis. <clears throat> and uh, what I want to do is talk a little bit about some of the things that NASA has in mind for Artemis. So uh, this is a graphic that sort of explains what it is that we want to do with Artemis. So uh, the, the first thing that you see here on the left, this is NASA's next human spacecraft. This is called Orion. Uh, we are hopefully going to launch Orion very, very soon in the next two years. Orion is going to be a spacecraft able to take people to the moon, which we currently don't have a spacecraft that's capable to do that. So uh, being able to build Artemis and have it actually successfully take people to the moon and back is sort of the next big thing that NASA wants to do in human spaceflight. At the same time, we're going to deliver a lot of scientific payloads to the surface of the moon. You can see a couple of examples of those here. But Really what all of this is in service of is being able to send people back to the moon. Right now, the plan is to send humans to the moon, including the first woman astronaut to walk on the surface of the moon by 2024. So what you see on the far side of this picture is a spacecraft uh, with a habitat that is in orbit around the moon. You then see a picture of someone walking on the surface of the moon by 2024. This is what NASA's plan is. This is what we want to do. So with that, what I want to do is talk about what's called mission control. So mission control, uh, what we see here is a picture of the, uh, the mission control center at Johnson Space Center. Uh, and this control center is actually where the International Space Station is operated. Uh, and you can see it's these uh, people sitting at banks and banks of computer monitors. So what is it that these people actually are doing? And why does time delay make their job a little bit harder? So that's what I'm going to talk about for another few minutes here. Um, <clears throat> Before that, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about communication. So a brief and woefully incomplete history of how it is that human beings have communicated each other over great distances. Um, so in the 1860s, it used to be that if you were living in New York City, for example, and you wanted to send a message to your friend in San Francisco, for example, um, that message would have to go by stagecoach. So you would have to write your letter, and then that letter would have to go into a carriage that had horses drawing that carriage, and it would take that carriage weeks and weeks to get across the United States, weeks and weeks. For a very brief period of time, we created something called the Pony Express for about a year, a little bit longer than a year. What this was, it was a series of way stations with horses, and basically a rider would take your message and hand it off to somebody else who would immediately get on another horse, and you would then be able to take this series of way stations across the United States in days. Well, that was supplanted by the telegraph, which was wires that transmitted electrical signals. So if you laid these wires on the ground, you could then use the electrical signals and the wires, uh, as long as there were wires between the place where you were and the place that you wanted to go, and now you can get your message in minutes. So the transatlantic telegraph stretched wires under the surface of the Atlantic Ocean uh, in 1866. Uh, then came the advent of things like the telephone, and pretty soon we had the fax machine. And uh, then we had computers starting in the 1960s and 1970s. And eventually we get where we are today, where we have chat and Zoom and Facebook and text messages. And what this means is that someday we're gonna have an astronaut standing on the surface of the moon, trying to text, that's one small step for man and one giant leap for mankind. But this poor hapless astronaut is wearing gloves and uh, as a result, the, uh, the text messages will, will, uh, will not be transmitted quite right. Um, <clears throat> darn you, autocorrect will be a thing uh, that we'll be doing then from the surface of the moon. Okay, so <clears throat> with that in mind, uh, communication is hard. And when we go back to space and we go for long distances away, mission control, which depends critically on communication in order to do their job, their job is gonna become a lot harder. Why is that? Because Mission control basically does everything and anything that the astronauts on board their spacecraft need done. Mission control is the power company. They are the plumbers. They are the air conditioner repairmen. They are the doctor. They're the phone company. They're geek squad. If their spacecraft breaks, 
And if the astronauts don't know how to fix it, then they have to call on mission control for help. But they can't do that if mission control is very far away and if you can't talk to them immediately. So what we're going to do now is we're going to play a little audience participation game. One of you lucky people out there in the audience is going to get picked by uh, the, the moderators in order to play this little game. And the setup is this. We have a spacecraft that is at Mars or on its way to Mars. <clears throat> uh, this, in fact, is a picture of Phobos, not Mars. Phobos is one of Mars's moons. And the, the spacecraft has a problem. And the crew can't actually solve that problem. And so they have to call mission control for help. But the problem is that they are 10, they're 10 light seconds away. And so what we're going to do is we're going to play a little bit of that conversation between mission control and the astronauts. So what's going to happen is I'm going to have some text on the left-hand side. I'm going to be the, uh, the spacecraft calling mission control. And the other person is going to be mission control. But 10 seconds will go by between every sentence that we say. And we're going to see how crazy, complex, and frustrating it could be if they have to try and solve a problem this way. Uh, I apologize. It's mission control who gets to talk first. So I'll, I'll be mission control. So hello, Artemis. This is mission control. How can I help you? But we're 10 seconds away. So let's count down. 10, mm -hmm. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. But Our now toilet hasn't been working for the last day. All right, so mission control gets to wait 10 seconds. Nine, eight, seven, six. You get the idea. Yeah. So, Artemis, when was the last time that you cleaned that toilet? Nine, oh my eight, gosh, I have to wait 10 more seconds. Seven, six, five. Four, three, two, one. We last serviced it three weeks ago. <clears throat> All right, so now we're twiddling our thumbs for 10 more seconds. By the way, um, toilets. The astronauts have toilets on their spacecraft. And those toilets do break. And it's not a happy thing when the toilets break. <laughs> Artemis, have there been any power interruptions? Wait a minute, what is this? Why does my toilet require power? Can you imagine a battery-powered toilet? <laughs> really? What do you think? Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, three, two, one, zero. No, the power hasn't gone out. <laughs> OK, so that's the end of the audience participation game. So I hope that you can all see that um, you know, if, you're, if you're either on either end of this, if you're either the astronauts or if you're the, the mission controllers, that you know, this, this, this very, very long time delay between each, each step of the conversation can be really, really frustrating. That's what we're going to experience when we send people into space like that, okay? Okay, so now we're gonna completely and totally switch gears and we're gonna talk a little about artificial intelligence. Um, and <clears throat> uh, after that, we'll get into how AI is actually gonna help solve these problems. So <clears throat> it, it should be relatively easy to see uh, that we hope that AI is gonna be a way that we can either solve these problems of communication delay by making the spacecraft smarter so the spacecraft can you know figure out what's going wrong so that you don't have to get into that back and forth in the first place or to help make the astronauts smarter so they can figure out how to fix whatever the problem is without asking mission control for help but what kinds of ai do we think we can actually make do that so before we get into some of the specifics um i will i will briefly introduce artificial intelligence Many leading AI textbooks define AI as the study of intelligent agents that perceive their environment and take action that maximize their chances of successfully achieving their goals. Okay, so there's quite a lot to unpack there, right? So we have to perceive our environment, our AI. We have to be able to act. 
And we have to act in service of goals. And we may not be able to do exactly what we want, so we're trying to maximize our chances. So that's quite a lot. And we'll talk about some more of these things uh, in, in not too long here. But <clears throat> what, what I will do is I'll talk about three particular types of AI that I extensively use in my daily life, my daily work. And, and then we'll see how these things uh, make, make AI agents like that definition it calls for. So the first component that we'll talk about is what's called planning and scheduling. So what does planning and scheduling do? I have to have some goals and I have some activities that may or may not help me achieve those goals. And what my planning and scheduling system does is it tries to choose what activities to do and when to do them in order to make those goals work. So what I have here is a picture of a plan that International Space Station astronauts actually performed on the International Space Station some number of years ago. And you can see that this is a bunch of colored boxes. Um, what's happening in, in this plan is that the, the boxes sort of in the middle of this plan are what each particular ISS astronaut is doing. Colored boxes that are the same color are part of the same activity or related activities. Uh, the gaps between them are times when the astronauts aren't doing anything. The stuff at the top is when it's day and when it's night, or rather when the sun is out and when it's not. Uh, some of them talk about things like when communication antennas are available in order to talk to the control center. So planning and scheduling is a way of automatically building a plan like this one for the astronauts. And quite a lot of things need to be planned in schedules, everything from what science you're going to do to um, when you're going to maintain the toilet or other pieces of equipment, uh, even including things like when you're going to turn the solar rays on and off. So you plan and schedule everything. So that's planning and scheduling. <clears throat> Once you've actually built a plan, it's not much good unless you actually perform the activities uh, that you plan for because, well, if you don't do them, you're not going to achieve the goals. So the next component of AI that we'll talk about briefly here is called plan execution or task execution. And um, <clears throat> you, can, you can imagine that, you know, the simplest sort of plan execution strategy is do the task that you said you were going to do at the time you were going to do it. But uh, sometimes you can't do it exactly at that time. You may need to wait a few minutes. Like, for example, if the Zoom is totally full, you may not start class at 12 o'clock. You'd like to know that it's okay if you start class at 12.02 or 12.03. So when we talk about execution strategies, those are ways of staying a little bit flexible so that you don't always have to spend all your time planning and you can actually do what you're supposed to do. Uh, this, this window that we have here in the middle, this is basically tracking the activities in, in a plan that the crew have done. So you can see what you're currently doing, you can see what you did on the top, and you can see what you're going to do on the bottom. Uh, this is used for a variety of different purposes. One of them is just making spacecraft into robots and having them execute those plans all by themselves. Uh, the other part is like this display, helping people, in particular the crew, but sometimes flight controllers, understand what they have done and what they're going to do, and whether the next thing they're going to do is, work or is, is going to work or if it's not going to work. <clears throat> so the last... AI technology we'll talk about is called fault management. Um, unfortunately, our spacecraft break. Sometimes it's the toilet. Sometimes it's something much more serious, like we've lost power. Uh, sometimes it's a nuisance, like having lost a light bulb. So what we want to know in fault management is, has a fault taken place? What fault is it? What has happened as a result of the fault having taken place in the first place? And uh, has a fault caused sufficient damage or disruption to the spacecraft that we can do what we thought we wanted to do? Can we still execute our plan? Or do we have to do something very, very different? And so uh, the picture that I have here in the middle, we have lost a part of a power supply. So there's this big red block in the middle here. This is a major part of the power supply. And as a result of having lost this power supply, all the stuff that is circled in red has been lost along with it. So that's the kind of display that you want to see as part of your fault management system. <clears throat> OK, so those are our principal components of AI. What I'm going to do now is uh, talk a little bit about the kind of computer science and mathematics that we use uh, as the underpinnings of these kinds of AIs. Uh, this, this AI capability, all of these uh, use a form of mathematics called automated reasoning. And I'll use planning and scheduling it as an example of how some of these automated reasoning systems actually work. This gets a little technical, don't be scared. Um, it's actually fairly cool, at least I think it is. So uh, what we have here is a little scheduling problem. We have two activities. We'd like to take a picture of something, uh, say a star, and we'd also like to send some data to Earth. But we have this set of constraints 
the star that we want to take a picture of is only visible at different uh, times, as indicated by these green boxes. And the ground antenna is visible at a different set of times. And furthermore, um, I can't send data to Earth and take a picture at the same time. So my problem is to choose when to do all of these activities to satisfy these different constraints. So the take picture activity has two possible windows, two choices. Which one should I choose? Well, um, <clears throat> because of the way that I've drawn the size of the take picture activity and the second visibility window, uh, it should be relatively obvious to see that I can't fit the take picture activity into that second window. So really that's no choice at all. So I have to do it in the first window. But when I do that, I have to move the send data to earth activity late enough that it doesn't overlap. So this is fairly easy for us to see as human beings. Uh, it's a very visual sort of thing, but a computer can't quite do it that way. And so what I'm gonna do is walk very, very briefly through how we might represent this using uh, automated reasoning. So the send data to earth activity has two choices and we'll abstract those away and we'll call those choices one and two. The same thing for the, uh, the take picture activity. Uh, it has two choices, one and two. And what we then do is we have this little table here up at the top. And what this does is it describes the legal combination of choices for the take picture activity and the send data to earth activity. This is called a constraint. And <clears throat> basically the red no says that I can't choose option one for both of them. Uh, and the second red no says that I can't choose option one for the send data, uh, the, send, the send data to earth activity and option two for the take picture activity. So what I now need to do is use this as an instruction to my computer, my automated reasoning AI, in order to decide how this works. <clears throat> so the way that the AI works, the way that the automated reasoning works is that it builds a tree an abstract tree that chooses uh, possibilities one by one, and it uses that constraint to figure out whether it's solved the problem or whether it's made a mistake and has to go make another choice. So at the beginning, I have nothing. I have no choices. I haven't chosen anything. The first thing I may do is I say, well, I'll choose the first option for the send data to earth activity. Then I'll choose the second, I'll choose the first option for the take picture activity. And then I realize that that's not gonna work because that first, N in the upper left corner is, is my result. So then I have to try the second choice for my take picture activity and lo and behold, um, that's just fine. And so now I could stop searching. Seems pretty straightforward when you look at it this way, uh, but that's because this is a very, very small problem, one constraint on two variables. <clears throat> now, there are a couple different ways that I can do this. So the first thing I did is I basically guess and check, right? So that's what I just described but there's something a little bit smarter that I can do. What I can do instead is I can, after making my first guess, I can propagate. I can inspect the constraint and I can realize that there's no possible way that the first choice of the take picture activity will work given that I've made this choice for the send data activity. And so I can prune or propagate some of the options and build a smaller search tree. Why this is a good idea is not obvious given how small a problem this is, but on large problems, this turns out to be a ridiculously powerful thing to do. There are much more weird and complex forms of this that are very, very powerful indeed. And really, I wanna stop there because the whole point of this was to just give you a little taste of what kinds of mathematics we use in order to do some of these kinds of AI. Okay, <clears throat> when we put all three of the components together, planning, scheduling, execution, and fault management, what we get is something that looks a little bit like this. This is the way that our spacecraft can take information. <clears throat> uh, and so our, our AI is perceiving its environment by getting information from the spacecraft. It can take action based on plans that are built or schedules to achieve their goals. Those goals can either be things like taking pictures of stars, which is cool and useful, or it can be dealing with faults that I didn't expect, but that nevertheless happen and that caused me to have to do something other than what I had in mind. So that's how we take planning, scheduling, and fault management with automated reasoning underneath, put it all together in order to make uh, a functioning artificially intelligent spacecraft. So I wanna say a couple more words about software. Uh, <clears throat> there, there are a lot of different kinds of software that you've been learning about, I know that. Um, and I know that there are questions about what kind of software we might wanna use and the problem with building AIs for spacecraft is that 
uh, we have to put them in space. And unfortunately, space is a very, very bad place for computers. It's either very, very cold in space, or it's very, very hot in space. And it's often a very challenging radiation environment. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of radiation that can cause damage to our computers. And so the software that we use has to run on computers that can survive in those environments. Those computers can't use just any old kinds of software um, because the software can be too big, it can be too slow, and so on and so forth. And really the whole point of this is that when I think about running my spacecraft where I have lots and lots of pieces of information and lots and lots of software that I have to use, and all that information has to come from sensors, and those sensors may go bad, and I have to think about that, and so on and so on and so on. Software has mass. All of these things cause my spacecraft to be bigger and more complex, and so I can't just use any old kinds of software or any old kinds of languages in order to build my AIs. All right? Okay, so that was a huge, whole, big mouthful of stuff. Um, now we're going to talk about how to actually make it happen. So this is the place where I get to talk about some of the things that NASA has done in order to build and demonstrate those AIs and actually put them to work and see if they do what we think that they're going to do. So uh, the, first thing, the first thing that I'll do here is I'll, I'll talk about some testing that we do. Uh, so this is uh, some pictures of a test that we did on the ground. So this was, um, this was a test that we did in Texas. We basically pretended that we had this habitat, this deep space habitat thing that's on the right here. And um, we, we, uh, we pretended that we were going to have uh, these, the, the, the spacecraft operate for a couple of hours at a time in the presence of time delay. And we failed a bunch of things. And we tried to see how the crew inside would respond and how flight controllers would respond. Uh, and that was a test of some of these kinds of AIs. And we tested planning, planning execution, uh, and fault management when we did that test. And that was very successful. Another thing that we do is we test spacecraft that fly, sort of like the Orion. Uh, so this is a test where we see some astronauts who are sitting at um, a series of screens like those that they would be uh, using inside their Orion spacecraft. And in addition to those folks, we have some people in a sort of simulated flight control room. Uh, so what we get to do here is we get to build uh, scenarios in which sometimes something goes wrong, the crew has to figure out what's gone wrong, the flight controllers have to figure out what goes wrong, and we can test our fault management technology that we talked about uh, to see how good a job it does at figuring out what went wrong. So that's another test that we accomplish on the ground, uh, but we are also very fortunate to be able to do some tests in space. So this is a picture uh, of an astronaut in space on board the International Space Station, and he is using a, uh, a piece of software that we built to try and power up and configure some hardware that the astronauts don't usually have to take responsibility for. So this is a test to see whether they can do the job uh, that is usually done by people in mission control, but with the help of our software. So here is a screenshot of that software. And it's a little bit like that software that I showed you on the plan execution window. You can see that here's some things that have actually been done. Here's some stuff that hasn't been done. And there's a whole bunch of other information uh, that we thought that the crew might find useful. We also, uh, do tests uh, of much more aggressive sort. So this is a test of uh, the crew's ability to manage another piece of hardware. So this piece of hardware that you see here, its responsibility is to test the water to make sure that the water is safe to drink. But um, this, these tests have to be done every couple of weeks. There are maintenance activities that have to be scheduled for this. And sometimes it can fail. And if it fails, then it has to be recovered. So this is a scheduling tool that we built for the crew. It builds a schedule, sort of like that example that I showed you. And um, we, built this, we built this scheduler to see if the crew could schedule the activities for that, that water quality hardware themselves. Uh, we also built a fault management system. And we were able to test this on board the International Space Station. So you can see here, this is an astronaut who is using our tool on an iPad. And he is floating above the hardware, uh, the, the water quality hardware, as it is on board the International Space Station. And just to convince you that this is a real picture, you can see his colleague who's floating upside down behind him. Uh, so this is not fake news. This was the real deal. Uh, we had a great we had a great experience doing this. It was really exciting to see that uh, <clears throat> to see that picture come out. And um, what I'll do now is I'm going to pause for a minute and I'm going to play a video. So this was a, this was a news story that appeared uh, in um, gosh I guess this was. 2012 sometime? I don't know. Anyway, 
to so put astronauts on an asteroid by the year 2025. And to accomplish that, they are already working on solving some problems that you probably never thought of. Ned Hibbert is here live with that story. Ned? Yeah, of course, Don. The crew in deep space will need to communicate with ground control here on Earth. Now, those messages only move at the speed of light. That's really fast, but it's not nearly fast enough at the distances NASA is talking about here. I don't understand. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. You're looking great. How you doing, Control? It took just a few seconds for messages from the moon to mission control, but the moon is less than 250,000 miles away. If humans visit Mars or a near-Earth asteroid, well, they're not so near. Tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of miles. In deep space, the communications gap gets big really big. So the, you're looking at a minimum 10 minutes before you get an answer to a question. So you have to, you have to be a lot more intelligent about you know, how do you package information and then the ground needs to be able to respond you know, in, the, in a similar fashion. The deep space between the crew's question and the ground's answer, voice communications, eh, don't work so well. So it's hard to hold a conversation so we have to work out methods of communicating and having the right information at the right place so the crew can get the job done safely. One alternative they're testing today probably looks pretty familiar. It's basically a chat room. Now, it still takes 10 minutes to exchange information, but when the answer arrives, the crew can read it at their convenience. And they won't have forgotten the question. It's right there in the chat. Simulations like this refine the protocols for future missions. The communication can be voice. It can be data. So. The question is, what if that communication works in what way to help the crew be more autonomous from ground when they're so far away? Our species has yearned to travel far away about as long as we've been around. Just ask astronaut Lee Morin. He's been farther away from Earth than all but a handful of humans. So it's fundamentally something that we do as humans to go out and to explore things. And you know, solving the communications problem, that's just one small piece of the puzzle. Other NASA teams are working on different dilemmas of deep space travel and survival. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so that's just a handful of the kinds of things that we are working on in order to uh, develop and test these artificial intelligence technologies. Uh, and as you can see, we've done quite a lot, but there's, there's plenty more work left to do. And uh, we're doing all this early testing now so that uh, when it comes time to actually send people to Mars, uh, we'll have the technology ready, we'll understand what works and what doesn't work, and uh, we will be able to explore the solar system uh, in its fullest. But there's plenty more work left to do, so um, I am hopeful that one day we will have all of you working on it along with us. So um, the, the last thing that I have here on these slides, uh, and these slides I think uh, we'll, we'll be able to share these so you won't have to worry about writing these links down, but uh, NASA has a lot of great educational resources at its disposal in order for you to go and learn some more. Uh, there's an Artemis Hour of Code Challenge in particular. There's a lot of great K-12 resources, and uh, there's plenty more to learn about Artemis Program and, and all the other things that we're doing. Uh, and uh, I think that's about it. All right. Thank you very much. So we're going to have uh, um, everyone, you can ask questions. So how do you become an astronomer? and to get a job at NASA? Okay, um, so astronomers uh, are people who look at the stars and look at distant objects like galaxies. Sometimes they look at things like asteroids. Um, there, there are astronomers who primarily use computers and what they do is they try and simulate uh, how asteroids or galaxies or stars work. Um, many astronomers are actually not employed by NASA directly at all. They're employed by universities, uh, or other large organizations like the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. So you can actually be an astronomer but not work for NASA, but you can get money from NASA to do different kinds of research. So uh, to be an astronomer, you go to school, um, you can major in physics or astronomy, and, uh, <clears throat> and then after that, you can look for a job in any one of those places. How do you work at NASA? Um, how do you get a job in NASA, I guess? Yeah, how do you get a job at NASA? Well. So um, being, being a ha having a job at NASA is much like having any other job. Uh, you, you need to find someone at NASA who is looking for uh, a person with your particular skills. 
There are 10 NASA centers across the United States. They're located pretty much all over the US. Um, <clears throat> and uh, NASA employs people to do just about everything that you can imagine. So there are technical people, people who do you know, physics or computer science or mechanical engineering or electrical engineering, but there are people who work in communications, education. Uh, there are people whose job it is to uh, cook, for example, because food doesn't work quite the same way in space uh, as it does on Earth. And so figuring out how to make the astronauts food that is safe and healthy and effective to eat is very, very important. Uh, they, they, enjoy, they, they employ doctors uh, to make sure that the crew stay healthy. So um, yeah, it's, as I said, it's much like getting any other kind of job. When does uh, NASA expect to have the next manned, oh, actually next, have the manned mission to Mars? <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. So the, the current plan, as I said, was to have humans on the moon by 2024. And, and in that video clip, you, say, you, you heard that we thought we were going to an asteroid by 2024. So clearly, we're not doing that anymore. <clears throat> um, the idea is that we go to the moon and explore and learn on the moon for about 10-ish years. And then after that, we should know enough to understand how to go to Mars. So that would put humans on Mars by about 2025 or 2035. If, if all goes well. Okay. Well, Claude on Facebook asked, what do you need to study in order to be part of the mission to Mars? <clears throat> what do you need to study in order to be part of the mission to Mars? Well, so if you want to be an astronaut, that's one thing, but you can be part of the mission to Mars without being an astronaut. As I said, you could study just about anything. You could study communications, you could study food safety, you could be a doctor. Um, and all of us are part of the mission, right? It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter whether we're the astronauts or whether we're the people who help the astronauts get where they're going. Um, we're all part of the mission. Okay. So you can study just about anything. Awesome. All right. So there's another Facebook question. Um, you know, we do have lots of people dialing in from outside of the U.S. Can you work for NASA if you are not an American? So the short answer, alas, is no, you cannot work for NASA as a, an employee of the federal government, which is what I am, but NASA employs people indirectly. Uh, we call those people contractors. They are not employees of the federal government, but uh, somewhere between a third, a quarter and a third of the people who, who work at NASA centers are working for one of these contracting companies uh, and they do much the same, not, not exactly the same, but they do a lot of the same things that, that the rest of us do. And those people can sometimes be non-American citizens, but uh, if, you, if, you are living from, if you're living outside the United States and you want to work as a, as a federal employee, then you have to emigrate to the United States and eventually uh, get your permanent residence in order to do that. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what your team does specifically in NASA to the extent you can share? And several people were asking about what do you do at NASA? Right, so um, my background is a computer scientist. So I, I study computer science. And um, <clears throat> so what we do is we basically think about the uses of computer science and in particular AI uh, in order to solve these problems of, of how, to, how to have the crew be smart, how to have the spacecraft be smart when we have the time delay. So those last set of examples that I showed you of things that, that we did in order to test these different AI technologies, uh, those were things that my team did, all of those things. Okay, cool. Um, there is a, someone asking, what role do you think private companies will play in the effort to get to Mars? <clears throat> yeah, this is a great question. So first and foremost, private companies have been working with NASA pretty much since the beginning of human spaceflight. If you go back to even Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, which were the, the, sort, of, the sort of three precursor human spaceflight missions, um, some of the early work was done mostly by the government, but uh, private companies actually built most of the Apollo hardware, right? Um, at the time, the Information Laboratory at MIT, which later became Lincoln Laboratories, built the Apollo Guidance Computer. Uh, Northrop Grumman built parts of uh, the Gemini spacecraft, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. So private companies have been with us since the very beginning. What we're seeing now is private companies doing some more of what NASA did. So previously, most of the astronauts were, let's call them US government, right? They were, they were government employees. But 
what we saw with SpaceX, uh, with the demo mission one uh, to the International Space Station, that was, that was the beginning of what might be a fairly big shift, where now you don't necessarily need to be a NASA astronaut, you could be a SpaceX astronaut or a Boeing astronaut. Uh, and even that isn't quite as new as it might seem. Both the United States and Russia for many, many years have taken non-NASA and non-Russian you know Russian government astronauts to the International Space Station. So, so even that isn't quite, the, quite as uh, new as it might be. But the, the, thing that, the thing that would be the newest thing of all, which, which I think is still somewhat into the future, is to have a company say, um, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna launch a mission to Mars with people on it, not because the government paid us to, but because we felt like doing it all by ourselves. Uh, so far, that has not happened. And uh, I, I know that SpaceX has plans to do this. How long into the future until they get to do that? Not really sure. Okay. So several people actually asked both on Zoom and on Facebook is uh, how to become an astronaut. Like some people ask, can you become, can you start a aerospace engineering and then become an astronaut? Or um, yeah, it's just like <clears throat> in general, how do people become astronauts? <clears throat> Yes, so um, you can be an astronaut coming from basically any background that you like. Uh, it is certainly true that a lot of astronauts have military experience, especially pilots, uh, but it, that's, that's, not as, uh, <clears throat> that's not as important as it used to be. So there are astronauts who have been doctors, there are astronauts who have been electrical engineers, there are astronauts who have been geologists, there are astronauts who have been um, you know, uh, Navy SEALs, uh, Air Force pilots, Air Force doctors, uh, Navy doctors. So really, the, the things that you need to be an astronaut are you need a sense of adventure, you need a sense of curiosity, uh, and you need a lot of dedication and a lot of perseverance because um, lots of people would like to be astronauts. And uh, so the, the, people who, the people who hire astronauts can afford to be quite choosy. Um, but no, you should not let any particular background or, or area of interest that you have uh, preclude you from wanting to become an astronaut. Okay, cool. Uh, what specialization of computer science, this is a Zoom question, what specialization of computer science in college uh, that you should learn so you can have the best chance of working for NASA? I don't really think that there is one. Uh, the, the computer skills that NASA needs are many and varied. So if you just go back to looking at the, um, <clears throat> the, the kinds of things that, that I showed you, you can, you can see that there's a lot of different computer science involved in every single one of those applications. I, I think the one that I find the most funny personally, um, so you remember the picture of the astronaut who was using his iPad floating above uh, the, the piece of hardware that we had him managing on the International Space Station. Well, um, so if you're an iPad iOS developer, we, we needed such a person to build the user interface that that person used. So you could be a UI developer and work for NASA. Um, you could do the, you know, the artificial intelligence automated reasoning, like I said, that, that could get you uh, a job at NASA. You could be a network engineer. Um, imagine how difficult it is to maintain the computer network between the control center and the International Space Station. So you can be a network engineer and work for NASA. Um, so again, really the, you know, the, the, the particular skill is not terribly important. Um, you know, certainly there, there are some that, that tend to be more interesting and more useful uh, sort of you know, on, on, a, on, a, on a much more specific basis, but that's, that's not something that anybody is gonna know until you start applying for work and finding out what people want. Um, Having the interest in NASA and the ability to, and, and desire to solve the problems, that's the most important thing. Um, and going back to the topic of astronaut, I actually met a couple of them before. Um, one of them I know, he studied computer science. Well, actually he didn't study computer, he just studied at Stanford University and then he was in engineering and then he became a doctor. Um, and then he's actually also a really good athlete. So combine all of these together, and he actually, I think he actually went to the space several times. Um, so really cool. Um, what motivated you to work at NASA? <clears throat> when I was getting, uh, <clears throat> when I was in school, I actually, uh, <clears throat> a, a person from NASA Ames Research Center where I work here in California, 
came to give a talk about some things that he was doing. And what, what he was doing was quite interesting because it was, it was uh, in, in sort of theoretical computer science work, um, <clears throat> those automated reasoning problems that, that I was explaining, some of those problems are quite easy for computers to solve and some of them are very, very hard for computers to solve. And at the time that I was in school, we didn't have quite as good an understanding of why that was. And, uh, and, and this researcher was doing some very, very interesting work like that. So I actually spent three summers working with him and uh, at the end of that, he offered me a job. So it's funny, I came to NASA to do computer science, but here I am working in human spaceflight. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. All right, so the next person is Angelina. Um, just... What does NH um, NASA stand for? What does NASA stand for? That's a good question. Oh, yes. NASA stands for National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And it used to be in the 1940s, NASA was not called NASA at all. NASA was called NACA. And I will leave it to everybody to do homework and figure out what NACA was. And the second piece of homework, and you can report this all to, uh, <clears throat> to, to, to Karen and Jesse, is when did NASA change from NACA to NASA? So that's an interesting history for you to do. So would you like later on in the future? Do you um do you think actually people could really live on the moon like kind of for like a a couple years or something? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. This is a great question. So, <clears throat> um, you you heard at the end of the little news story that other people are solving other problems that we have for living in space, other than the communication delay problem. So, <clears throat> water and air and food. These are things that every human being needs to live. So if we're gonna live in space for any period of time or on the moon, we need to solve the water, air, and food problems. Never mind everything else, right? The radiation problem is bad. Problem of calm delay to fix what things that are broken, that's bad. Um, so let's talk about water for a minute. <clears throat> it turns out that there's a lot of ice on the moon. It's a little hard to find, but it is there. So one of the big challenges that NASA has been thinking about for quite a long time is, do we need to bring all the water with us? Or can we mine water from the cold, dark places where it is on the moon? And so you can now imagine things like, well, geez, we would need some big bulldozers in order to, you know, large amounts of dirt where all that water is. And then we have to transport it to some place where we can melt the water out. And then we better chemically treat it very, very carefully if we think we're going to drink it. Um, but water is useful for some other things too. Water is composed of hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is a very, very useful component of things like rocket fuel, as is oxygen. And so uh, water and water has a lot of other potential uses. And if it were less expensive, and less complicated for us to use the water that was on the moon instead of bring it all with us, that would vastly increase our chances of being able to live on the moon. Cool. Or any other problems that would have to be solved for us to live there for a long time effectively. Yeah, a lot of things that are so natural um, is actually gonna be quite challenging once we start thinking about living somewhere else. Um, awesome. That's really, really fascinating. Um, I think everyone had a lot of fun. Um, I want to thank you again, Dr. Frank, for joining us today. Uh, we definitely should try to plan for another future in the, you know, another talk in the future to talk more about other interesting things about NASA and then space. Um, so let me make, I'll tell you a little bit more about other classes coming up. Other people asking it, people actually were asking it on chat as well. And most of our classes are small group classes, only three or four people. And uh, you can sign up on our website, create-learn.us, and sign up for a bunch of different classes, including artificial intelligence and robotics as well. Of course, all the classes we offer are beginner's classes. They're not nearly as sophisticated as what's done in NASA, but hopefully it helps you to study studying the subject better and then become an you know, expert over time. 
So we do have more open talks coming up. These are large open events. We wouldn't keep trying to improve the Zoom and Facebook live experience to try to find the right balance um, between performance and participation and as well as um, making sure the chat actually works properly. Um, but our, our, we are planning an, a couple of talks about Minecraft, which is pretty exciting. So you guys probably heard that recently because of the colleges got shut down and MIT, Stanford, and Berkeley, and several other um, schools, the student actually built their entire campus, rebuild their entire campus um, in Minecraft. So we might be able to invite a couple of them come in here to talk about how they build it, and might even be able to do some tours and with the students. So we'll see, it's still being discussed. So that's one area, it will be pretty exciting. I know many of you love playing Minecraft. Um, the other thing is, this is something we just started recently uh, because so, so many games are all closed. We figured that it would be cool to be able to help you guys get some exercise. So we've been inviting um, really great athletes to come do online PE classes. And there's one tomorrow, the person is called Jonathan Horton. He actually won Olympics medal twice and is also a ninja warrior. So some of you might have met him on TV. So he will be doing a PE session tomorrow around the same time, actually about 12.30. So half an hour later than how when we started today. So I hope some of you can join that as well. Uh, so with that, we are going to close our session today. And thank you again, Dr. Frank, for such an awesome, awesome presentation, really fun and I learned a lot myself as well. And thank you everyone for your participation. You guys have been great. And uh, I hope to see you again in future classes soon. <clears throat> All, right. All right. Bye. Thank you everybody. Bye, thank you, bye.